What do you want to do first? Leafs or I got Leafs, Rempy, PWHL, and then I got a bunch of other stuff for you. Uh, and we're doing Leafs. an A-list. Well, now. because I was listening to you and Kevin Woodley coming on okay. um, the drive. And I, you know, obviously the whole wall Samsonov thing, we don't have the analytical, like just eye test, right? And how you feel when you watch them in net. But when he's explaining like the goals above expected and the way mm-hmm. the wall was playing, he used the word Vesna at one point, And I was like, mm-hmm. on the DVP, like, whoa. But I mean, that's why those people have amazing jobs. Like, that's why Kevin Woodley is so smart, because he broke it down in a way where I was like, put Joseph Wall back in that net. And I think I was kind of on the fence before you guys talked, so it was really insightful. That's why you have great guests. But I think the the debate between those two, for me, is like, I'm trying to distance, okay, Samsonov needs, like, the protective bubble around him, right? You need to really make sure that he feels good and that he's performing mm-hmm. well. But then Joseph Wall is your guy of the future, and, like, you want to give him opportunity to grow. And if if Kevin Woodley put it, like, he's going to be a top 10 and he's going to be the guy of the future, and Samsonov's a question mark even after the season. Like, I don't know how you balance this. They got a game tomorrow. I don't know who's starting. But you, you just think about, like, last week with the two Bruins games and, like, did they show their yeah. hand, right? And I listen to you guys on Leafs Talk, and I know you talk about this all the time, but... Yeah, this is going to be the thing. Unfortunately, we already talked about it so much this season, but it's been basically the main debate is who's your guy. So, again, I think that they're just going to keep playing the schedule more mm-hmm. than they are going to play the hot-handedness. Because my guess is that they think that Wool is so good that even if Samsonov is out playing him, mm-hmm. he's not going to get the vast majority of the net. Whereas if it was the other way around... Like, let's say Wool had dominated those two starts against the Bruins. Well, then we wouldn't even be and thinking, And Samsonov, right? well, I think that what we'd be looking at is Wool for sure plays against the Flyers on Thursday, and he plays on the Saturday night game, and he plays on the Flyers on the March 19th, mm-hmm. and then Samsonov gets the 20th. You know, so like, many, like, times away. But from that's what I'm saying game. is I, I think that there's been some quirks with the schedule that have made it kind of easy to split the net yeah. and not have it feel. They've had that cushion. Yeah, I'm not like, have oh, it feel too schedule. weird. So I kind of think if you're doing this and you think that both guys are in the fight, to me, I would do the kind of same thing, which is mm-hmm. play Samsonov against the Flyers. Mm-hmm. Let Wool get the start against the Hurricanes a on a Saturday one. night, which is a bigger game. And then give the same opponent to Samsonov yeah. and then give Wool the second half back to back. But you're splitting them again. My thing is this is like, uh, so again, I respect Woodley, but mm-hmm. I talked about it. I do think that there's a tendency with the stats community and he's an eye test guy too. Mm-hmm. And I watched his mm-hmm. video of him with Wool. To me, there's no doubt about it that, like, my biggest takeaway from the interview is feeling more confident about Wool as the guy of the future if he can That's maintain his I health. That's what too, yeah. Where it's like, this guy is just going to be entering his prime. He's 25 years old. He's right, gonna head be, on his shoulders. He, like, exactly. sounds like a perfect guy. I watched that video of them breaking down film together, oh, yeah, and yeah. it's very clear that mm-hmm. Wool is, yeah, he's just one sharp cookie. And you can tell that uh, Kevin, who knows the Leafs goaltending yeah. brass and who's connected with guys like Sanford, there's there's a reason that goaltending guys would gush about mm. wool, okay? Like these, and, and this has been something that has been was part of the Matt Murray thing, mm. is that they liked Matt Murray yeah. not because of he did even mention him too. He did, but mm-hmm. I, I know that the Leafs goaltending department there was a strong feel of this guy is way more equipped when mm. it comes to the mentals, and with Samsonov it just doesn't uh, it doesn't seem as though he receives coaching the same way mm. as some of the other guys. What I will say is I think that the stats are a little noisy this season with how horrific Samsonov's start was yeah. and how little information we actually have of Wool. Like when he's talking about him being a top five Vesna candidate, it's like, yeah, but that's over the course of a month right. and a half of a regular season. <laughs> I, I need to see that over a really extended mm-hmm. period to have it. And now since he's been back, you're kind of going, well, let him ease into it. Mm-hmm. So we're not really using any of these numbers. Now down the stretch, I want to see which of the two yeah. is feeling better with the knowledge that... To me, you need to kind of keep Samsonov more in the split because you don't want to have him lose his confidence. 100%. Because there absolutely is a possibility that Joe Wool, who doesn't have, you know, a long track record in the NFL of staying healthy or we know how he's going to mm-hmm. handle big-time pressure, that if he cracks or crumbles or stumbles or gets injured, mm-hmm. you want to have Samsonov ready? He's still ready? so young. That's Game exactly, one of the, yeah. of the Stanley Cup playoffs when the Leafs probably face the Bruins, uh-huh. and he's played the Bruins a few times, and... Yeah, like he's he's young. Yeah. Samsonov, I know, won a playoff series for the first time in a long time. I think you got to, and this sounds, I don't know the proper way to say it, but keep Samsonov happy in a sense because you, yeah. you, I don't think there's like the clear confidence level that Wall can do it for ex- like even two rounds. No, you, I don't know how you gonna, could have that. You're going to play another goaltender, you know, and if Samsonov really needs the 
the moral support, then you, you, you lay it out perfectly. I think you're right about the schedule and maybe it's a little bit of a blessing that mm-hmm. it's been easy to say, oh no, well, yeah. we'll just go back and forth. Because I don't remember the last time they went, you know, you just mentioning Philly, Carolina, Philly and played the same goalie three times. I think we'd yeah. be shocked if they did that, right? Like yeah. I don't remember the last no, no, time no, they that's, ran somebody. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't think that, I don't think the Leafs will go with Samsonov in three of these starts, regardless of how he plays. Yeah. But I would be... I would be a little surprised considering that he has played so well if they didn't give him the Thursday start. I need a Russian father to sit me down. I know. And give me vodka and say, figure your life God, out. God, I, I love picturing that. Because. You could lose your other job. I, I seriously would. Yes, sir. <laughs> like, I'll will, figure it out. How will you feed your family? I won't. Yeah. I'll figure it out. I'll do anything. Get, I Get back in this wor- net. It worked. I don't know. They need to put that guy on like retainer. Make saves, Ilya. Sit down with Lilgren. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sit yeah, down with anyone. <laughs> no, he's got something special. Stop crying, Timothy. Yeah, something St- happened. Stop hanging head during all games, <laughs> Timothy. Yeah, because yeah. Lilgren looks uh, it's not so great. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a black and white issue. Mm-hmm. I think that it's going to take some time. And to me, again, you're totally going to be rolling with the hot hand when yeah. it comes playoff time. And I just think as of right now, Samsonov is hot and he deserves at least that little bit mm-hmm. of credit. The other part of it too is like sports are a meritocracy. And as much as Wool is probably the guy of the future and mm-hmm. he's probably the guy of the now and mm-hmm. all of the things that are the indicators are like, this is going to be the the player and you're probably likely or more likely to to gamble on this guy. I, I think it's just important in general for a team culture when it comes to accountability mm-hmm. that you're playing the best person you're playing the person that's going yeah. better this is one of the things that drove me crazy about Sheldon Keith throughout the season it's like mm-hmm. Max Domi would have a game where he finally was playing well and you'd still look down at the score sheet and go uh, seven he minutes played, yeah why didn't he play any time why didn't he get any minutes why didn't you bump him up one of the best moments of the year was Nick Robertson when he finally played a good game yeah. they went you know here's 17 minutes he was like wow he looked good seems like an easy concept by the way what do you think of the Nick Robertson thing that he is kind of talking to the media. He's like, I'm not happy about it. Like, what do you think about that quote? Because mm, I, I think there's two ways tough. to look at it. I mean, he's he's kind of been around for a long time. I'm surprised that he they didn't find a better fit for him at the trade. I think Lilligram was oh, a bit better, but they couldn't. Yep. I think he's also a victim of his brother's success. Definitely. And... I and this market. He, and this market. Yeah. And he has a specific fit, and that team doesn't have that fit right now. Like, they have too many good top six players for him, and he's not a bottom six guy. Uh-huh. I think, I, I'm not surprised that he, I don't know the exact quotes, but started. Here, want me to read it? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, here, this is the quote. Quote, I understand it, but I'm not going to sit here and say I'm happy. I want to play, mm. but I understand my contract situation. Obviously, if it wasn't the way it was, maybe it'd be a different situation. Mm. End quote. Okay, so. To me, anyways, mm-hmm. I look at that and go, why would you ever want a player that is just... I'm good I, I, with it. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. I'm good. So I, I preach right transparency. Thing. Have you ever have you ever spoken with Nick Robertson? No. Okay, he's bright. Like, he's not a dummy. Mm-hmm. He's not like, whoopsie, daisy. Uh, I, intentional I, with his words. Yeah, yeah. He's a smart kid. Yeah. Like, he really is. He's sharp. He gets it. He's actually, I would say, in the out of all of the hockey players I've spoken to, he's definitely in the top, like, five, six nice. in terms of where I'm like, ooh, you... You're getting all the things There's here. something in there. Well, it's not even just something in there. Like, I'm not trying to insinuate that everybody's dumb, but that he actually was confident enough to speak mm. how he's feeling without just doing the complete retraction of, well, I don't want any kind of smoke here. For like, sure. I'm willing to do this. I actually think that it's brave of him to say that because he knows the market and he knows the narrative. Like, he uh, he fully understands what he's doing with this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that he kind of balanced this in a pretty sweet mm-hmm. way. My only counter to him is I'm like, hey, man, no offense, but you haven't really done anything that mm. proves that you should be here. And I also think that this is kind of the problem with smaller skill guys. Yeah. Because if you don't play him in the top six, there's no... They, fall, they, don't, they don't belong. Well, yeah, that's it. Six. It's like, where is he supposed to go? Mm-hmm. He's got no place to go. And so it's it just, I think it's a tough fit. It's You're right. It's tough with the brother. It's tough with the mm-hmm. pedigree. It's tough mm-hmm. with the hype of the market where... When he was first coming up and we were looking at his stats. He was like the next thing kind yeah, of. Yeah, but I I think that it's pretty clear to well, me. Watch, he'll be a change of scenery guy and he'll he'll be uh he'll haunt the Leafs because I don't think so. You don't think so? No. I think if he could find a role with a team where he's playing yep. top six minutes on a team that doesn't have high expectations where he can put the puck in the net and get confidence, I I think he just needs like a breakthrough where a coach believes in him. Yeah. He gets some 
opportunity under his belt because he can score. Like, yep. I forget who you had oh, on. he can shoot the puck. Yeah, you had someone on the other day. It was Myrtle. Yeah. And you, I think it was Myrtle, and you're talking about um, just, like, the goals per 60, and he's up there. And, and obviously, like, the sample size is a lot smaller. Yeah. But he has those flashes where you're like, that's an NHL shot. Like, Big time. he can score. But if you're not getting the lineup, I'll give him a little bit of credit for, like, the, what is it, March? And he's finally kind of saying something a little bit, you know, standing on his feet and being like, oh, I, I, you know, I'm not happy about it. That's a tough, like, you know, Matthew Nice has already come in and jumped over him. He's not going to play with the big guys, and there's not really a spot for him. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't think he's going to be in the playoff roster, and I don't know how he's going to handle how he's going to handle another year of being up and down in the Marlies. Like, I think this is coming to him. a head. I think yeah. that it's over. Um, I think that the relationship is done. And even when he was like, if it wasn't that way, things would be different. Dot dot dot. It's like, oh yeah. Um, of course they would, because yeah. first of all, if things were different, they would have had to waive you, and someone else would have picked mm-hmm. you up. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And if they weren't doing that and they were sending you in the press box, I think that they would have tried to work with you mm-hmm. on a trade. This is them doing, I think, what best they can mm-hmm. to try to maintain the relationship to the point where he doesn't just basically publicly come out and say, trade me, or trade me now me. and sewer whatever little value yeah. he's going to have this past offseason. Mm-hmm. You also have to have him buy in because if you do sustain an injury to your top He'll six guys or to someone, you gotta, you're, he's still one of your better options. Mm-hmm. Like you have to keep him engaged from an offensive standpoint. You don't have a ton of dudes that are down in the Marlies that are, ooh, don't worry. You can bring this guy up. Like, Connor, they, I looked at the Marlies roster the other no, day. It's horrible. Yeah, it's been this way for who, years. Who's, who is next in any position? <sighs> hey, listen, one of my favorite things is that there's people who like, there's a couple of people who like cover the Marlies. And I, it's weird that we're such a big, the, the Leafs occupy such a huge space. But even if the Marlies are good and have stuff, there's not a lot of conversation about them. There's such a complete non-entity mm. which is tough it's a very very strange yeah. thing it's a leafs town i've always said this it's a leafs town i don't know how much of a hockey town it is mm. um but the last couple of years whenever anybody tries to do write-ups on any of these like marley's players <laughs> i just go can you save it i know this is your job but the idea that we're trying to overhype the uh, alex steves of the world well, is it's yeah. just not it ain't happening for me but yeah with robertson i think that they're trying to keep him engaged they mm-hmm. know that they still need him this year he's a part of the team if something happens he's getting in for the playoffs it's not going to happen and I'm sure that they've probably communicated to him, hey, uh, if you're a good soldier, we'll make sure that mm-hmm. you're either on the team or you're getting some kind of favorable trade this offseason. Like, we're, we're making sure that you go somewhere where you're going to get to play yeah. and where they really want you. That's the thing is I think that the Leafs want him. Just they want him to be exactly this, the emergency mm-hmm. call-up guy that might be there and provide something. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to the only lack of potential stuff for him, to me, it's... I would have liked to have seen him on a power play. Hmm. And for him, that's the that's one where he could cook. That's what I'm saying. That's the yeah. one area. Cause when you say, uh, you know, will he haunt the Leafs? Mm-hmm. I see a guy with an NHL plus shot. Yeah. NHL work ethic. Mm-hmm. I don't think the skating is great. It's true. He's small and he's not defensively responsible. Mm. So it's not a, clean across the board. Oh, definitely fit. not. Or he'd find a way in. Not a plus playmaker. If you put him in Bobby McMahon's Bobby body. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> his Bobby. Bobby's Bobby. Bobby's Bobby. If you put him in Bobby McMahon's body and you could just create a player, yeah. there, there's one individual. Like even Bobby McMahon's jumped over Nick Robertson. Like Everybody it's, has. it's tough. It's yeah. totally tough. Anyway. I guess I guess he's getting in. I like I don't really know With how Bobby? they're yeah, Bobby no. McMatthews? <laughs> Bobby McMatthews, yeah. No, I just, I don't know exactly even, like, they called up Robertson, and I'm like, okay, but how does it work now? What's the, <laughs> how are they making this work exactly? He's not going to get shuttled back down at some point this season because it feels like he absolutely is, so mm. uh, something to watch. Anyway, uh, let's talk a little PWHL. Love that. Okay, so a lot of early success. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's been more successful than people anticipated because I think that most understood that this was the right time and this was the right place Mm -hmm. and that like they didn't schedule things like the Bay Street, what they call it, Battle of Bay Street. That's right. They didn't schedule things like that with the thinking, oh, I hope we get half the building. Mm -hmm. You know, that was never the case. They knew the optics. They knew that this was going to end up working out. My question is, how much of the gap is happening though between the teams? Because what I'm starting to notice is that it's like, it's pretty clearly a top. There's there's a very clear mm-hmm. couple of teams at the top. Toronto and Montreal are very good. Minnesota is good. Mm-hmm. The other teams don't seem to be there. Mm-hmm. And then there's like a draft class that's going to come in that's apparently like, what, 70 plus players? Yes. 
okay, so how much of that 70 plus players, I don't like parity. I don't mind having a team, you know, that's at the top or having two of the better teams. The only thing is, is that when you're a 16 league, that's a little bit harder when Mm -hmm. there's like a drop off between the top three and then four. How much talent is actually going to be injected into this league over the next couple of years? Because I think that there's going to be two thoughts is one that you want to have more balance Mm -hmm. within the teams that you have. You want to keep growing the product. But two is that if you ever are going to think about expansion and you do want other people to be interested in you teams, want like a diluted product. Yeah, you, you've got to have enough talent that mm-hmm. it can be there where you feel like you're going to games and you're you're seeing not just one good player on a team. I would say this draft class already has, I think, close to ten current Olympians that or have played for the Olympic team. Okay, that's huge. From that's a way Canada, number, USA, yeah. and internationally yeah. or in their development pro- programs. Yeah. I mean, the Czech Republic is on like they are a force to be reckoned with already. Um, and one of their coaches is actually a PWHL coach for Ottawa. I would say that immediately the top first or two, the first two rounds of the draft, because it'll only be six, will be difference makers, undoubtedly. There mm-hmm. are some girls that have already represented their country at the Olympics, at the international level, and or are Patty Kazmaier winners or are breaking records at school. Like the, the NCAA I played in versus the NCAA that is now is miles and miles ahead like these girls are coming into college already with their foot in the national team program like that didn't happen really that was a rare occasion to have already represented your country while you're going to university so I think this draft will be unbelievable um but I think there's that there's that like excitement to grow the game more like I'm going to Detroit this weekend for the PWHL um sports night broadcast so that's exciting um, yeah they're going to do um this weekend they're playing in three or this week they're playing in three different NHL arenas uh obviously okay they're, so they're doing different cities but so it's a Detroit weekend. doesn't have a team yeah so they're going to okay. play uh in Detroit right yeah. after the NHL game uh, yeah. they're going to play in Pittsburgh uh at where the Penguins play and they're going to play at XL Center, Energy Center where they're doing play no, 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 just Detroit. Okay. Um, because that's cool. his first game. Wow. Like, I've never been to hand- Detroit. That's. Uh, I was going to say that's a very cool. I don't know. Trip. It'd anyway. be fun. So yeah. anyway, so um, they're already testing out markets, and and I think when I looked last time, the Detroit games sold out. Yeah. Um, Pittsburgh will be sold out, and the Excel Energy Center. They've already been playing their Minnesota games there, so yeah. I'm not sure. Um, last time I checked, like they fill half the bowl, and they keep the camera showing that side. But you know, it's hard to sell out an NHL arena every single night. Anyway, so clearly there's... If they can get half the bowl every single night, that's actually a lot. They're doing pretty well. Um, yeah. The worst attendance, for sure, is New York. They're struggling. It's mm-hmm. like, because it's in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And they're playing out of two arenas. I was going to say, it is kind of funny when they're like, New York. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's like, they went and took <laughs> yeah. their, like, promo shots in Times yeah. Square. And I'm like, you know, you yeah. have to take the train to Connecticut to go watch <laughs> yeah. your kids. Anyway. They're uh, very different yeah, places. As like, someone who has been all around Connecticut, <laughs> yeah. I can tell you it's... You're uh, like, wait, so this isn't New York City. This is, yeah. uh, this is like, uh, Danbury. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so there's obviously a lot of excitement about expanding. I think they need to be like cautious about that because there's yeah. so much, there's money coming in every day. They announce a new sponsor. They announce a new partner yeah. and like money, 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 money means, well, we could probably afford to add a team, but I think you're going to wait until the, the quality is so undeniably good that you need to add a team That's to help. It. And I think this draft will be awesome. I, I mean, I'm obviously not a NCAA draft expert, but there's sure. going to be people you're that, more so than most of us. Well, yeah. I'll take that. Um, I will say that since it's it's open to not just NCAA, there'll be girls internationally that'll come over because mm-hmm. before the PWHL was like set in stone, I know a lot of people playing in like, you know, uh, the Swedish elite league or playing in Austria and they're good. They're mm-hmm. not probably at the level of the PWHL right now because their leagues are a little bit different. But even if 10 of those girls want to put their name in the hat, there's 10 more players that are playing mm-hmm. at a pro level. There's U sports and U sports is still a little bit behind NCAA. Um, so you know, even if five girls are of caliber, I think the draft will be pretty strong up front. And then, you know, if there's 70 people putting their name in for the draft, not all 70 are going to find a roster spot. Then you're going to have the question of like, where do these reserve players go? Because at this point you can have like two or three reserve spots. Like if I wanted to be good and go play for Toronto and work my butt off, like it's, I'm like thousands of steps behind people, right? There's no AHL. That's the thing that's going to start to get hard for fans because you might be uh, the top player at uh, Clarkson and you might be wanting to put your name in the hat and you don't make the Toronto team because, well, they're pretty good. Like they've got three solid lines and maybe you're looking to be a fourth liner. You don't make the team. What do you do? 
Do you mm. stick around in Toronto and be a reserve player and train every day and get paid uh, not a lot of money um, and try to, like, make the team if somebody gets injured? Or do you have to go play in a Swedish le- league or do you stop playing? Like, we're going to actually get into that problem pretty early where there's nowhere for the players that don't make it to play. Mm. And uh, I'm playing right now currently in, in which actually would be classified as the next best league. Yeah. It's a senior A division one women's league. And the people that play in this league, we play Fridays and Sundays. We're all retired pros or retired NCAA athletes. And we joke around. We're like, we'd be the next to line. Like technically, if you're coming out of college, you don't make PWHL Toronto. You might come play in a league like this and just to keep yourself ready. That kind of makes sense to me right now mm-hmm. with where the league's at. Like because honestly, they can't afford to have an AHL. But, but that's it. It's like you you can't have a development system that you're paying for along with this. But and come so, join this like OWHA yeah, yeah, women's you, you, you basically league. have to try to beef that up to mm-hmm. the point where you're going to have to start working harder. You can't just show up. And, Actually, we just made <laughs> we, we made the final four. <laughs> I'll send you. We can come watch. Yeah. Uh, we made the final four, but it's funny because there's still that like competitiveness between these girls because you know i'm still wearing my dartmouth gear and i lined up against a girl that was wearing clarkson gear and i remember playing against her i was like oh i'm gonna get this girl right and you remember like playing against them and and now we just play for fun but next year i don't know maybe 10 girls are gonna join this league because they don't have anywhere to play so i think it's a good problem it's an interesting problem for them to try to navigate down the road when they need to have bigger roster Mm -hmm. flexibility when there needs to be more reserve spots for players because you watch one of these uh, NCAA games and you're like, oh, these girls are really good. Like, okay. really good. That's good. First of all, I think it's funny that you were like, you know, I get competitive in these games. It's like, first, I, I haven't even sniffed even close to your athletic achievements. And I've never once played in any sport where I haven't been like, this is the most important thing that's no, ever happened to me. And like, I need to win this. Or I will else back I, check my ass Yeah, off. like I, I will <laughs> never. I, I've mostly quit playing sports because I've started to slow down and mm. I just can't even handle, like, I, I don't have any fun unless I'm good. No, you, yeah. And so it's like, as soon as I show a slight deterioration, mm. it's just, it's so over. You disc golf. Dude, that's it. You're I'm just so, elbowing people in the park. I played basketball my whole life. Yeah. I would say basically every week. Mm. And I have not played, I haven't even shot a ball, I think, in uh, over a year no. for the first time ever in my entire life because it's just like, once I start going and seeing, like, oh my God, play, out there. Once I started to notice players who are worse than me be able to look even out mm. with just like the athleticism, done. even though I'm trying to keep in shape, <laughs> that hurt me in, yeah. a, in a, in a, in a, that hurt me deep. Like I was like, holy crap. It's just a, an army would not. Here's the thing. I, I honestly, I would cook. Gee. I need I, to see this. I genuinely think that first of all, his side, like there's nothing he could do. Well, that's, you can't teach height. No, and it just, it doesn't matter. Like, because my most vulnerable thing now is defense, and mm. it's like, he would have nothing for it. And, you know, when Jokic backs someone up, it's like, that's all I would do is I would just back <laughs> him up and do baby hooks and score. I Like, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even shoot. Actually, I'd beat you every single way because I'd just be like, how do you want me to score? I'd be asking you questions because there's no way that you mm. could stay in front of me. You're too small. We need to do mouse stuff like that as Sportsnet. Like, why don't we I have, know. like, a pickup hockey league or well, pickup? Basketball guess what? League. I got lots of gripes with uh, not having enough uh, social well, outings and activities. I could be activities. the lead of the social committee. We used to have Erica Diamond. Well, Erica Diamond used to work here. You she need was the one woman to do it, and I'm she here, was the folks. social coordinator of Sportsnet. And the second she took a job outside the industry, everything fell apart with the company in terms of all the social functions. But hold on, mm-hmm. uh, to, to kind of close this thought, I get the difficulty of not having a development system. Mm-hmm. That sucks. I actually really like that there's going to be an influx. I think that this, from the sounds of things, is actually the really smart way to play it, which mm-hmm. is. Okay, the league is going to have to be a, a bit of a traveling circus for a while mm-hmm. in the sense of you got to do the game in Pittsburgh and explore the market. But mm-hmm. basically, you're showing people, hey, you have a really good product. Definitely. Don't expand until it actually is at the point Kinda. where it's you're like, like bursting at the seams. Yeah, where you're like, holy crap, there's just too mm-hmm. many good players. Yep. Now we're looking at women's leagues in Europe where women are going to go have to play pro mm-hmm. there because there's actually an opportunity to play in this league and it's mm-hmm. very good. Once you get to that point, you're bursting at those seams. Mm-hmm. That's when I think that you expand and you try to add two more markets. You can't do it when you've got one team, like I think it's New York that's at the basement, right? That they're just... Yeah, they're, they're not doing too well. But, uh, but of course, though, it's like you think about it too, it's uh, these women have to live somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. And so obviously the Montreal, it becomes a hub. Obviously Toronto becomes yeah. a hub. 
obviously some of the like players in the league wanted to be in those two spots. It's not a coincidence, Poulain, you know, like, oh, Kel Supreze. Well, they got yeah. to pre-sign. For sure. I'm just saying, mm-hmm. though, but that's always going to be an advantage oh, yeah. for those bigger spots. You don't want to live in Connecticut, okay? If you've been to, no offense to Connecticut. I've been there. Yeah. It's... <sighs> It's not one of my top five places I've ever mm-hmm. been, okay? Mm-hmm. In your mind, you're like, ooh, is this going to be like Great Gatsby? Is it? No, <laughs> it's not. It's pretty gritty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a lot I of... might have had a different Connecticut experience going to a school where everybody, like, their parents were, like, governors. No, there's there's the nice those parts nice of Connecticut. And they lived in houses yep, in Danbury or, like, uh, I've been to those houses. One? Those are nice. Oh, it's... There's some pretty places. But it's like... If you're not them. Yeah. Go to Hartford. Yeah, ooh. You're getting elbowed. You think Hartford's a cool place? It's great. Wait, here's here's your thought when you go to Hartford. They had an NHL team here. That's yeah, shocking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's your first thought when you enter mm. Hartford. Oh my God, what did they do here? Like, how did this operate? How did it last as long as it did? Oh my God, this nice is nice jerseys. That's why. Very nice jerseys. Very nice sweaters. But yeah, it's pretty unbelievable that there was a professional hockey team there. Uh, anyway, um, I think it's doing very well. I mm-hmm. think that the form is going good. This is the final one on it. Mm -hmm. Is it in a good place from players being happy and people being happy with this stuff? Is it ever? Okay, that's because that's a good thing. Because this is what I'm the most proud of. Okay, good. Because I get the inside. That's what I'm saying. You're the insider. You would know like how everybody's feeling. One hundred. What the drama level is. So when I played in the CWHL just for one season before it folded unannounced to us, except for a conference (laughs) call where they said, "I don't know if you ever heard this, but." It was the end of the one season I played in the CWHL, and they're like, hey, we're going to have a call um, Mm -hmm. on March, whatever. Exciting, whatever. So we all pick up the phone, and they're like, hey, by the way, we're we're canceling the league as of, like, the end of this call. So that was was the way things (laughs) operated then. Hey, by the way. (laughs) So in the year that I played in the CWHL, um, which had already been running for, like, 15 years and was probably supposed to be at the hype, uh, the highest that it had ever been, my salary for the entire year as a ninth overall pick, guess what it was? My full salary. Oh, yeah. I think, what, 8000 Two thousand. Two, yeah. That was what I made to play professional you hockey. I was. <laughs> Seriously, when you look at my stats, that's like $2,000 yeah, yeah. per goal. That was yeah, it. I yeah, got one. Yeah. So, so, and we played out of Thornhill Community Center. So I had to drive to Thornhill Community Center every day. Yeah. And um, the barn wasn't nice very much, but uh, we got our own locker room and we got gear. But uh-huh. we had a, that was kind of like, everything we got to be pro. I also at that time was had a full-time job, also coached the Ryerson women's hockey team mm-hmm. and had um, and played pro hockey and did a bunch of other things to make a living. And I was a full-time student for about that. Um, the girls in the dressing room beside me, one was a fa- firefighter, one was a teacher, one worked as a physiotherapist, one uh, was in med school. Like mm-hmm. everybody did everything else to stay afloat. Now, the, the the salary cap obviously is like around a million per team in terms of like everything they have to pay for their budget or whatever. Um, if you're the worst player on the team like me, you can make a living wage. Like you, mm-hmm. you do not need to have three other jobs. You don't need to be teaching skills sessions at 6 a.m. to tyke hockey players. So your focus is on hockey. Everything you want, you need is provided to you. Um, like my best friends are on Montreal, so I get the Montreal scoop. Every day they can go to the rink and have breakfast for free. They can get free physio. They can get It's better than bath. Cincinnati Bengals. It's, yeah, exactly. They'd be rated way <laughs> higher than those guys in their locker room. Yeah. Um, but everything is given to them. They just focus on hockey and taking care of their bodies. And if they're injured, they get whatever they need when they need it. They don't have to go through, you know, Sunnybrook Hospital like a normal person like they have doctors they have people that help them um their travel is is way better like they're staying at nice hotels um they are not taking a flight and playing the same day there was one game we had to play calgary and we got on a flight at 6 a.m and we flew landed in calgary went straight to the rink played a hockey game got back on the plane and came home Mm -hmm. that was pro hockey like it's not pro like your Mm -hmm. legs are jello you're tired etc so now they're giving them like just a better environment to play hockey. And you can tell the product is a million times better. Like these games are unreal because the girls are focused on hockey. They're not focused about my midterm and having to get into work right after the game and work a 12 hour shift as a doctor. Like they can focus on hockey. They're so much happier. The environment of like doing a real draft, picking new teammates, creating a chemistry, a team motto, a team buy-in, having a new coach, having a new fan base. It's all been awesome. Um, 
I think like it's kind of been a whirlwind as we all know. Like mm-hmm. I'm sure the girls would love jerseys with logos and they would love um, a team name and they would love things to not have felt so rushed to drop the puck on January 1st. But it was either that or drop the puck in October again. And they just couldn't do another year mm-hmm. of like messing but around. But not everything has to happen all at the same time. And like fine. And that's it. Exactly. If like, the product is as good as it uh, is, I don't care. I'll buy you another jersey next yeah, year. Yeah. No. And it's like with, with anything like this and especially uh, I think everything but women's sports for sure is like there's people who want it to fail so that they can make oh. a joke. But for the most part, it's so you're going to you're going to point at these things and go like, oh, the jerseys didn't happen. And it's like a bad look is tough look optically. Yeah. But then ultimately it's like, yeah, we just sold out. We just had multiple record crowds for mm-hmm. women's sports. You're like, oh, OK, like that's that's actually a thing. That's not just a they're making a lot of money. But that, that's what I mean. It's it's mm-hmm. making money and it's doing ratings. It's doing clicks. Mm-hmm. Uh, they need to get a better website. I've got to tell you like it's, this. My, the website is horrible. I'll, like they got to tell them. Oh, my God. Get, yeah. You got to have live scores. Oh, it's bad. Like that's no live scores is I'm like, what is this? Well, for betting, <laughs> you need first of all, oh, you know, I love betting on the PWHL. <laughs> that's why I've been watching a lot. Well, of you know, we could tell the listeners there's yeah. money to be made on the PWHL. There's money to be made, but it's I don't, insane. I actually don't want to bring it up because yeah. I'm making so much money They're on PWHL that rules. I'm like, no, I'm not even. Well, yeah. I'll say the one thing about when the P Dub first came out, uh, we were, we have our betting segment and I don't just don't tell people no, about my secondary tell. living, but they just, I'll just say they started <laughs> the over unders at six and a half. Oh my God. For a month. I was paying rent, honeymoon <sighs> fund, wedding fund, bunker fund. I was rich because it was six the greatest and a half time is actually in my whole insane. Life. Yeah. Now it's four and a half, I know. and you're still yeah, yeah no. you still know where to bet. Anyway, anyway, it's it's fun, but uh, I will say like the yeah, like I had somebody like people always want to push back on oh yeah they're selling out arenas. I'm like that is really important because that shows that there's a demand in that market. But it's mm-hmm. not even that you're just selling out arenas. Their social content is is really great. I think you're able to connect with the players more. They can build their own brand. They've got mm-hmm. their own their own feeds that are important to find. The YouTube streaming was it was genius. And yep, that was big. The fact that you can log on anywhere in the world, like I'll be on the YouTube stream. No, that's huge because again, when Someone I'm tracking my bets, I need to yeah, be able to have true. it. And that's what I'm watching. Someone in Brazil is watching. Someone yep. in like South Africa, yep. anywhere can watch these games for free. Obviously, you should watch them on Sportsnet. Yep. But even the three major broadcast networks sharing right now the rights, yep. like that doesn't happen often, and that's that's a really like important factor. And what happens next year? That's next year. But the fact that you can find hockey anytime you want to put on the TV, you're mm-hmm. at the airport, it's on screen, you're you're like at a bar, it's on. I just think it's easier for people that never really gave it a chance or never did the effort to find it on some alt stream or the one time it was ever on TV. Mm-hmm. It's just I'm having more conversations with people that are like, oh, I caught that. PW. Like McKee's obsessed. Oh, I saw that game the other night. And he's just like. You know, maybe he never got to get into the CWHL because it was harder to find. So more people just seeing it, more people finding it on their social media, more people mm-hmm. finding it on YouTube. Like it's just it's it's been a really great start. I just hope that, you know, year two, we all have the same energy. I right? Think, that's the uh, biggest that's, thing. That's the thing is sustaining the energy and making mm-hmm. sure that, yeah, everything doesn't happen too quickly and that people stay happy.